Good morning, Boker Tov, Shavua Tov. Hope, wish everyone a good day and a good week. Um, and um, I'm just uh, noticing here, uh, did the title come up? One moment. Uh, before we begin, we're going to begin learning. Uh, here we go. Good. All good. So um, uh, we're going to learn the Sefer Achinuch on the questions of inheritance based upon a question I just received around... Um, this issue of, uh, of uh, writing someone out of the will. Essentially, someone had a son who doesn't accept their new wife, and they wanna know if um, they can write him out because he's making things difficult for his new wife. So we're gonna come back to that question, but first we're gonna start with the Sefer Achinuch here, uh, Mitzvah 400, uh, around the issues of inheritance. And at any point, if you have questions or thoughts, feel free to, uh, to comment here. And, and weigh in on those. So we begin here, mitzvah number 400. Uh, what does it say here? Okay, here we go. Ish ki yamut uvein ein lo v'havartem et nachlato levito v'im ein lo bat. Right, so we learn here from Numbers, chapters 27, verses eight to nine. Uh, if a person, if a man dies and he has no son, then you shall transfer his inheritance to his daughter. And if he has no daughter, and it goes on. Right, so uh, we see here the concept of mitzvat dine nachalot, the laws of inheritance, or Yerusha, uh, laws of, of inheritance. This is actually, in all the Sefer Chinuch we've learned so far, this is by far the longest chapter. So the laws and technicalities are, um, are, are quite detailed around inheritance. Now it's interesting, in many ways we feel very, uh, naturally feel very alienated from the biblical model of inheritance. Because it's really a patrilineal system of how a man essentially, a father, uh, leaves his property to his sons essentially. And um, we feel at odds of that partially because of our egalitarian ethos, our modern egalitarian ethos, partially because of our sense of autonomy as modern people, we want to make our own decisions. And partially because of, because of, a, of a libertarian ethos, that I want to do what I want with my money and my property. I don't want the government or some other biblical law even to determine how I uh, leave my property. So can I cut my son out of the will? Can I give one son more? Can I give a daughter more? How can I adjust um, the way I give? Or must I follow the biblical rules? in terms of, uh, of, of who gets things here. Now, what's interesting here, um, as we're going to see, that right in the Bible, the women already protest, right, and get the halacha changed, essentially. There's three cases, one after the other, where um, there's essentially a protest from those who feel excluded from halacha, from, from Jewish law, and they protest, and the halacha changes, one case is Pesach Sheni. In Pesach Sheni, we have Passover coming up in a few weeks, that those who come and say, look, I can't bring my sacrifice on Pesach, on Passover. Um, can I have another opportunity? Because I was tame, uh, you know, I, I, wasn't, I didn't have the purity to, give, to bring my Passover offering. And so Pesach Sheni is established radically. You're going to have a second Passover where you can come and, and, and do it. Another case is where... Ruvain God and half of Manasseh, these tribes among the 12 tribes, say, we don't want to live in Israel. I mean, this is a radical claim. We don't want to live there. Can we have a land outside? Can, we, can our inheritance be outside? And essentially, the Torah comes and says, okay, fight in the wars inside the land, and then you two and a half tribes will be given land outside um, of the land. The third case is Benot Slavchad, and that's relevant here, that essentially only the sons were inheriting, and um, the women come and say, look, what, you know, what's going on here? So in the cases where there's not going to be a son to inherit, rather than bypassing the daughters, the daughters will, will come to inherit. Now, the biblical model is very complex, and the Sefer Achinuch goes on and on here about those details. It's worth noting that Philo and Josephus, Bo, and Josephus both note that the biblical model um, and uh, the rabbinic model, uh, ultimately, uh, is progressive for its time. Uh, they view it as a more ethical model than what they're seeing around them in terms of what's happening with wealth after. So um, the Sefer of Chinuch continues, continues here and talks about inheritance as a right, right? It calls it schut. It's a schut. And, um, you know, many, there's a mantra today among some religious Jews that uh, 
Judaism doesn't believe in rights, only in obligations, right? We care about the collective, not the individual, that it's a modern idea that we care about the individual and their rights. Um, and I think this, this is very oversimplified. Certainly we care about the collective and our obligations to the collective, and certainly there's corollary rights that correspond to obligations. But we see throughout the, the, the language of rights that emerges you know, in the Torah and in, in, in the halachic literature, such as we see here. Um, so we see here this this chut. Um, I did, uh, is it? Ah, okay. So I, I see my friend Jacob already has a has a comment here. Um, now, so the Sefer Chino continues in Bava Batra, and it says, "Ish ploni lo yirash imechav lo amar klum." It says here over in Bava Batra that if a man says um, that my son shall not inherit along with his brothers amar klum, it's like he said nothing at all. So that's very interesting, that we don't care about the parent who says they're going to write someone out, that there's no halachic weight to such a, such a declaration. So, okay, so we're going to circle back to that point, but um, uh, a few things on the way, um, uh, on the way to getting there. Firstly, is um, that it's very much frowned upon among the rabbis, this idea of, uh, of avoiding inheritance towards one's kids either to limit it towards one or to cut one out. Um, but, but, um, but even more so, there's other problems, like the one of gender we already mentioned. So thankfully, we have a way around this today where um, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, essentially, in a very contentious uh, way, suggested that um, um, one can use a secular will, that a secular will actually is just fine. Now, what one could say here is that the laws of inheritance are not mandatory. Rather, when there's money left over that's not resolved, it is the process. Just like gitin or shchita, right? There's no obligation to kill an animal. But if someone's killing an animal for food, here's the law as to how to do it, shchita, right? Or there's no obligation to get divorced, obviously. But if you get divorced, here's the way to do it, gitin. So too, there's no obligation to give inheritance in this way, some argue, but if you do and there's nothing specified, then here's the way it has to happen. Double portion to the first son and then give to the other sons. If there's no sons, daughters, and, and there's a whole formula to, to go on. But Rav Moshe Feinstein says, actually in a very contentious way, that we can rely upon secular wills in our day. He says over here in uh, Igrot Moshe in Evan Ezer 104, Although we're dealing here with a gift to be made after the death of the donor, and there's no such thing as a Kenyan after death, I mean, how can you make a deal after death? As the object no longer belongs to the donor, and such a gift is therefore not valid in Jewish law, nevertheless, according to the law of the land, a person can legally transfer with effect after death money or any other object, which at that time obviously no longer belongs to him or her. But in essence, it is clear, according to my humble opinion, that a testament of this kind the dispositions of which will be certainly be put into effect by the authorities of the country, does not need a Kenyan, as one could not imagine a more effective Kenyan than this. Hence, since a Kenyan is not necessary, they can uphold their right also against those persons who are the proper heirs, according to biblical law, by, by Torah law, although there is no such thing in Jewish law as a gift after the death of the donor. So all the Haredim really argue against this, the ultra-Orthodox uh, post scheme uh, authority, uh, halachic authorities kind of argue against this. But we hold by Rav Moshe Feinstein. Now some say we should, if you go to the Beit Din of America website, there's a form to add into addition to a secular will. But essentially Rav Moshe Feinstein says this works. We can, we can um, embrace our modern sensitivities of uh, giving to daughters and sons and giving to, to spouses and designating uh, as we wish based upon our, a more libertarian ethos that, that so, no one else should determine our money but ourselves. And, um, and uh, this is part of what keeps Torah relevant, is that uh, we can continue to make decisions which fall in line with our time. Now, there's an important concept called situmta. And, and uh, this concept basically means that the prevailing communal uh, customs of merchants prevail. Right, based upon Dina de Malchuta Dina, we follow the laws of the land, and then Satumta, that we follow the commercial norms of our time, which ensures that religious Jews essentially aren't bound to archaic models uh, of monetary disputes um, and monetary processes, uh, pre pre capitalism, pre modernity, pre pre globalization, and um, but we see here the importance of having a will 
The importance of being very clear as to what should happen. Of course, when there's no will at all, the state makes decisions. Um, or if, you know, in some case there were religious <laughs> authorities involved, they would kind of go back to some of these old norms. And obviously the importance of having an ethical will as well. Now, can somebody be written out? Now, it's interesting. If you look back at, at the tractate Kiddush in 18a, or in the Rambam Nachlaut 612, or in, in, this, in the Shulchan Aruch Hoshen Mishpat 283.2, um, we see an apostate Jew does not lose their right of inheritance, although the court, if it sees fit, may deprive them of their share. So essentially, one who um, uh, abandons religious belief uh, or traditional religious belief um, does not lose their rights. And also of interesting note, um, in terms of one having the right to, uh, uh, to even pass along their own inheritance based upon their own crimes, we see over in the Talmud in Sanhedrin, um, Sanhedrin 48b, that the property of a criminal who was executed for their crime, of, you know, executed in theory, there's not real execution, is not diverted, but belongs to those who would have inherited in the regular, a, in the regular way. Sanhedrin 48b. That even one who broke crime laws themselves, nobody's going to grab their money. It still, it still gets, uh, it still gets passed along. Now, this idea for a more egalitarian ethos begins to emerge that we shouldn't prioritize kids over other kids in the mission on Bava Batra in chapter eight, uh, mission five, where the, the, the Chazal, the sages are already seeing the importance of giving all children the same thing. And Chazal uh, derived this from Yaakov's attitude towards Yosef at Sadiq, towards Yosef. And uh, so we see this idea already emerging. And then we see in the Stei Chemed, he develops a will that designates the estate of a, of a man's deceased wife. Um, so there's, there's definitely a concern for, for spouses here. Um, but, you know, um, uh, and, and, and the Shulchan Aruch knows, and, and uh, we see some Rishonim, some medieval rabbis who also already knew, uh, this idea of dividing inheritance equally, not giving the Bechora, the, the, the priority to the firstborn son. Um, now, the question emerges of what do we do when there's estranged families? This comes up all the time. Rabbi, what do I do? Um, you know, the specific question I got, which I won't go into the details of, um, as I shared earlier, was um, I've gotten remarried and my son does not embrace my new wife. He's very mean to her. Um, so I want to give leave the money to her and leave him out. And essentially, uh, it, firstly, a word of caution that no one without understanding uh, all the details of a situation should get into the business of advising what individuals should do. So we should only speak in theory here, of course, because um, uh, every case, uh, fam every family is complicated and all family dy dynamics are complicated. But essentially, the general uh, ethical Jewish advice, if there's such a thing as uh, something general, is that... Um, um, bracketing the case of a child being a, uh, a murderer um, or, or a real, uh, you know, someone who's really a Russia, really an evil person by all measures. I mean, this is a mass murderer, essentially. This is someone who's, who's joined a mafia. Um, that um, uh, we should not disinherit children, nor should they get any less. Children should inherit, uh, even if we have family disagreements, um, even if uh, they've made choices we disagree with, that they've become more religious than us, they've become less religious than us, uh, we shouldn't change their inheritance. Um, or there's a family dispute and we become estranged. There's very, something very different about, about choices we don't approve of. We wanted them to be a doctor and they became a teacher, right? Or we wanted them to be more religious or less religious um, and someone being a wicked person. Now, uh, so I think, I think uh, uh, removing someone from the will um, and from the estate should be reserved for the most extreme circumstances. Um, but that in cases um, of, uh, of, uh, of just conflict or of disapproval, that there shouldn't be any, any change put in place here. Now, in terms of spouses, right, because as we see, sons pri are prioritized over spouses in biblical law. Um, you know, really two approaches are taken here. Some leave their, their, their funds to their spouse and have them decide how to handle that with uh, children, grandchildren, charitable contributions. And many uh, put money in an estate that has rules. And essentially it continues to provide for one spouse uh, at the same level they have, uh, you know, lived off for years and puts the rest of estate, starts uh, giving, towards, giving towards children as well. 
Um, and uh, that's something that one should obviously get advice on. In terms of giving to charity versus giving to children, certainly if one is wealthy, uh, one should feel obligations to be given charitably in their estate. When one is not wealthy or even of very poor means, it makes more sense to only give towards children uh, and, or towards spouse. Um, but certainly in the cases where there's a lot of wealth, um, uh, the priority of, uh, of, of charitable contributions is, of course, more, very high from, 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 according to the Jewish values. Um, but giving, to be sure, giving unequally to children can actually be acceptable and important not based upon who we love more than the other. That would be, of course, very detrimental and deeply damaging to family dynamics to, to, to give, leave more towards one than the other. And as I already said, we don't have to follow the biblical model of giving double to a firstborn. But the case of I have one son or daughter who's very successful, very wealthy, and two who are really struggling, right? Uh, two of them are school teachers, you know, they live off uh, $40,000 a year. One is a radiologist, makes half a million dollars a year. You know, um, can I give to them differently? And um, certainly there's some merit to someone saying I'm giving to all equally anyways. But I think there can also be merit to saying um, I'm going to, in this case, write out of the will, the wealthy, successful child and leave to the one who is financially struggling, to the children who are financially struggling, or perhaps... Uh, they're all equally successful in their career, but one has healthy children and one has uh, very sick children um, and prioritizing that. Now, if this is done, of course, one should make very clear that this is not about love or, or priority within the family, in, in verbally and written, um, that this is merely about the social circumstances uh, of how uh, the will is being uh, uh, distributed. Um, that one is getting more simply because of social dynamics, and then maybe symbolic token items can be left towards the child of means, but certainly nothing could be more detrimental than, than leaving any ambiguity of who is loved more uh, in a will. Um, and so if it, if it is given unequally, it should come with a very, a very proper explanation. Um, now, one of the challenges that emerges here uh, with wills in, at all is, is, uh, is the problem of social mobility. Right, that in poor families, inheritance is nothing or very low. Sometimes there's even debts. Um, whereas in wealthy families, they wealthy families they essentially pass their wealth down through the family, which continues to pass along inequality and make very difficult to have any social mobility. Not only because one is more likely to be successful if their family was funding them to be successful while alive, but that inheritance continues to drive in uh, a greater economic divide. And so certainly we don't want to eliminate the uh, economic motive to cultivate wealth based upon leaving an inheritance towards one's children. One wants to know their children and grandchildren are going to be okay after their passing. But we also need to take very seriously these economic injustices in society. Um, you know, Warren Buffett in his famous giving pledge, where he's challenging billionaires uh, to give away the major high majority of their, of their wealth uh, through philanthropy, to pledge that away. Um, and it's a question for all of us. At what point do the poor and sick take priority over um, uh, children or grandchildren who are really doing okay? Uh, it's, a it, it, it's a question that I think we can be challenged by. Okay, so to review where we're at so far, and again, feel free to weigh in any uh, questions or comments here as we're talking, um, that what we basically said so far is that um, there's a very complicated patrilineal hierarchy based upon uh, the Chumash, based upon the Torah, biblical law, passed down through the sages around giving to sons, and then because of Benot Slavchad, giving to daughters, and, uh, and then when do brothers, brothers come in, or even one's living parents and the like, um, and how it's frowned upon to uh, try to avoid inheritance going to any of, of one's children. Um, and then we see as we move closer to modernity, the desire to give more equally uh, towards sons and daughters and towards all children in general and to prioritize one's uh, spouse. Of course, in a uh, patriarchal sense, we're normally dealing with a, a, a man who controls the funds and leaving for, uh, leaving for his wife. But in our, in our age, we are able to develop a secular will, as Rav Moshe Feinstein says, 
because of the power of a matana, because of the power of dina de malchuta dina, we learn from some power of setumta, the following, the communal norms, that we are able to engage in such practices. And so the importance of having a will, the importance of talking with our spouses, with our, our, our parents, our siblings, our children about our desires, the importance of having an ethical will where we... Um, uh, we pass along not just our financial, our, finan- our financial means, but also our values, but doing it through video, doing it through writing, where we ensure uh, we can pass along what matters most to us. And so um, um, our lives are very short, and it's important for us to be very thoughtful about uh, the fact that we could die at any moment, um, and we should be very intentional about what we wish to leave in the world and how we wish to do that. And I think uh, we should not feel bound by the biblical mandate because that was, as Rambam says, the idea was to move everything forward based upon ancient society. And then rabbinic law essentially continues to move the system forward. So we're never just bound by Torah law because Torah law law continues to be bound up with rabbinic law in ways that uh, make it uh, accessible and meaningful and moral in, in our own time. Uh, the last thing I'll share, as so, so, so to circle back to this question that always comes up, um, bracketing the most extreme cases, we should not write out children out of our wills. Of course, this is not a blanket statement. The family dynamics can always be very complicated, but uh, the importance of making sure that children know they are loved um, and the importance of maintaining justice, um, even where there are disagreements. Here's the last theological point I'll leave with us. Before, um, uh, before we part for today. I want to suggest that each of us has five deaths. We don't die once, but we die five times. The first time we die is when we stop living life to the fullest. We stop living with joy, with meaning, stop striving to do our best and be our best. The second t- death occurs at physical death, the cessation of, uh, of heartbeat, the death of the brainstem. The third death occurs when our body is lowered into the earth, and we leave this walking upon this world, existing above the world. The fourth death occurs the last time our name is ever uttered in this world. And the fifth death occurs uh, the last time any impact we ever had on this world completely dissipates, as if we never existed at all. And I think each of these deaths can lead us to desiring permanency. We fear death, we fear every stage of death, so we want our name on buildings, we want legacy, we want to feel like we're really here. And I think that Judaism is really pushing us in a humble direction, a spiritual direction of impermanency, of not seeking to always exist, but seeking to really embrace our life as we have it, when we have it, but also really embracing the inevitability of death and our, the inevitability of our impermanency. Um, whatever our theology is about whatever uh, the next world is or is not, um, that we have one short life here to embrace. And so I give us all the bracha here that we should have counsel with our parents and siblings and spouses and, and even our children around how we think about finances and experts and legal and financial experts and rabbis around how to make these decisions and should be sure not to base them on um, the emotions that get intertwined with the complexities of family life, but rather to be very intentional upon legal and ethical priorities. And may we all have long life before we have to, uh, these inheritance laws take place. Um, in the meantime, we should be very intentional on what we're doing and successful so that we do in fact have what to leave uh, for ourselves, uh, for our families and for charitable means. And again, more importantly than that, perhaps is the ethical will that we leave behind. Have a great day.